Hey guys, welcome back to the 11th episode of Jock of All Trades. Today we have a little bit of a special episode. Um, we're recording this on April 7th, and as you guys know, the finals for the women's and men's March Madness tournaments were on April 4th and 5th, respectively. So for today's episode, we're going to be talking some March Madness with Coach Alfredo, who is one of the basketball coaches at Harker, and also our assistant athletics director. So yeah, let's jump right into it. What's going on, guys? We got Coach Alfredo with us right now. We're going to be talking some March Madness. So yeah, I think we can just get right into it. Um, yeah, so I think like the first question we had was, um, how long have you been following March Madness? Um, how closely were you able to follow it this year? And yeah, I guess just what's your history um, in terms of watching March Madness? So I'm a, as you guys know, I coached the boys basketball team and I've actually coached the girls varsity basketball team here. So total, I think I've got almost 10 seasons under my belt coaching basketball here at Harker. Um, but watching March Madness has always been a thing that uh, my dad and I used to do all the time and still do. Um, so when we lost it last year, it was kind of tough. Um, but I have probably been following it cl closely since middle school uh, when I got really serious with basketball. Um, but it's just, for me, it's a lot more exciting than watching an NBA regular season game uh, during, you know, during March and we get to the tournament and even watching the conference tournaments, the games are just at a different level and you know everybody has a shot. So. It's always good to watch it. And I know like a big part of March Madness is the bracket aspect of it. And so did you fill out a bracket this year? And I guess how did it go and how accurate were your predictions? <laughs> so um, I, I did fill out a bracket this year. We actually, with the boys varsity team, we actually did uh, fill out, um, we did, you know, on ESPN, we all filled out a bracket. I think altogether I finished fifth. Mm -hmm. um, and Vishnu, you you know Edis. He actually yeah working out with us. Um, and unfortunately, he has to choose between volleyball and basketball this year. But the kid who isn't going to play basketball with us actually won. <laughs> <laughs> so he actually got first. Um, I did have Gonzaga winning. I think the majority of everybody on the boys yeah. varsity basketball team had Gonzaga winning. Um, but a lot of people actually had Gonzaga and Baylor in there. So um, I think there was one. One bracket who had Ohio State, unfortunately, yeah. uh, winning it, and uh, their bracket got busted first round. And I guess adding on to that, is there like a strategy you use? I, I know I'm not a big uh, follower of March Madness, so I just put in all the teams that I thought sounded cool and hoped one of them would win. So, you know, you would always th you would think that, you know, the higher seeds would always win. But, you know, I think uh, when I first started really following and, and filling out my brackets, I would always feel that, you know, the higher seed would win. But every year, there's always that Cinderella team. Um, I mean, UCLA, right? Who would have thought a team who barely made it into the tournament would make it to the Final Four and give, you know, Gonzaga that great game, basically lose it on the last second shot. Um, but one of the things that I always, you know, I think they say this, the experts say this, but that 12-5 first round game is really, really hard for the number five seed because usually it's a high percentage of that number 12 seed um, winning. Uh, but another thing that I also like to do is, you know, those mid-major teams, all those underdogs, like, you know, Loyola, any teams who have a high senior class or if they've got seniors on that team, been playing together for a while, mm -hmm. they start to play well, especially in these tournaments. And also, you know, any hot teams going into the tournament, um, Syracuse is one of them. They, you know, weren't seated too high, but they came into the tournament playing hot and pretty far so which is awesome yeah i think you like at least for me personally when i was just filling out my bracket it was just a lot of random stuff because like i've never really watched college basketball i didn't really watch any of the season um but for you is college basketball something you watch like throughout the season or do you more so just kind of tune in for march madness so i tune in for march madness um i do try to tune in um during the season but when usually College basketball is also the same time as um, high school basketball season. Mm -hmm. So this year was obviously a little unique because our basketball season is actually starting now. So I had more time to watch. Um, I do try to follow the local teams. Um, I had a buddy of mine play at St. Mary's. So I've always traditionally followed St. Mary's a lot. But, you know, any, any ties that I had, I was following UC Riverside. They have the first uh, Filipino-American D1 basketball coach. And my buddy is an assistant coach there. So I was following them. Um, but I do, you know, like I said, I, I love watch, watching college basketball. It's a little different. When you watch NBA basketball, there's a lot of ISO. There's a lot of different things. But 
with college basketball, you get to see some more of the technical stuff and watching kids play fundamentally, but it's pretty awesome. Yeah, I think like something we see in like something you reference, like all the upsets in March Madness, we see it every year, like this year, um, with like all the underdogs like UCLA, Oral Roberts in the beginning of the tournament. So I guess what was just your general reaction to all those upsets and all sort of the unpredictability of just March Madness early on? You know, every year it happens. And then there's always a team that's going to upset and just have a, a great run, just like Oral Roberts, right? The 15 seed. Who, <laughs> who would have thought that they'd get all the way to the Sweet 16 to pick up, you know, the win against Florida, the big win against Ohio State. Um, that was pretty huge for them. But these upsets, it, it's going to happen. And, you know, if you ever pick them in your brackets, that's great. But that's what I think makes the March Madness so great and appealing because, like I said earlier, the high seeds don't always win. There's always going to be that Cinderella team. Um, and I think it's exciting because, it's like, you know, Nobody, I'm sure, was following Oral Roberts basketball until they won that first game, and then everybody was rooting for them. Right? Yeah. Same thing with Loyola. They, I mean, Sister Jean, she became a thing a couple of years ago, and they got pretty far again. So it was these upsets are, I think, what bring, you know, a lot of ratings and what brings the excitement for March Madness for sure. Yeah, and I think one of uh, the biggest moments for March Madness was uh, Suggs' game winner against uh, UCLA. And I guess, what was your reaction to that? And did you have any other like favorite moments or favorite games from the tournament? Well, so that game was just back and forth, back yeah. and forth. Um, it was, it was, it was, it was crazy to watch. Um, I think there was a charge that was taken by Drew Timmy that was a huge call defensively. But I remember when Johnny Juzang tied it up and I think, you know, everybody was like, oh, another overtime. And then when Suggs just <laughs> came in and, you know, I'm not going to say it was a prayer because he shot the ball and he banked it in. I don't know if he, he meant to bank it in, but it went in. But yeah, definitely that was a high uh, moment for the tournament for me as well. I think that was something that was huge. I think um, another game that caught my attention was when Texas lost in the first round to Abilene, Abilene Christian. That team, they came out to play and Texas was supposed to win, right? Three seed, but they came out and uh, they finished that game and I think they were down. So to come back and to finish that game was, it was actually huge. Yeah, I think just like that Suggs game winner, like you see um, Johnny Lake Shuzang, he like puts up the shot, then gets his own offensive rebound and scores. It's like a moment of relief. And then you see him like running down the court, just chucking up a shot. Like you never expect that to go in, but then it does and then the game's over. Yeah, it was just crazy. It was. And I think uh, when UCLA also played, I think um, was it Alabama, almost the same thing happened for them, right? It went to OT because of another guy that hit a, hit a shot to go to overtime, like almost a half court shot. So for UCLA, they just had some, well, I mean, they won that game, right? But then they've had, you know, how many overtime games and they just, they came out to play. And, you know, I think uh, Coach Cronin said they, his boys deserved more, uh, but unfortunately just ended short, but hats out to those kids who played hard. Yeah, I think like at the beginning, you mentioned like how you've been watching March Madness, like with your dad and for like a long time. So I guess, um, what's your favorite March Madness memory sort of of all time, of all the years? and sort of tournaments you watched? Kemba Walker, uh, UConn, I don't know, I can't remember the year, but won the biggest tournament. I think they won, I think, uh, four or five games, right? Another team that wasn't highly seeded, and then they went out and won the whole tournament. I mean, that's a lot of games that they played. I think they played in the first round of the Big East tournament, qualified to get into the tournament, and played all the way to the national championship and one. And I think, I mean, for Kemba, I mean, I will always remember Kemba Walker for that. Um, but I remember, you know, when, you know, talking to my dad, I remember that during that time, I was like, is he going to be able to do it? Like he did in the Big East. I don't know if you guys remember, but the Big East before they split up was this you know, Syracuse was a huge, there was a, a great competition in that league. It was a big league. And for him to just win that league, you know, playing in Madison, Gar Madison Garden, you know, I thought he was gassed out. I think they were done. Like, oh, they're going to lose the first or second round. But to continue his momentum and to continue what he did with that team uh, was pretty awesome. So that was a, a highlight for me. Yeah, and I think on a more serious note, uh, I don't know if you saw, but there were, like, 
uh, video circula circulating, kind of like highlighting the disparities between uh, the women's uh, weight room and their situation in their uh, in the women's March Madness tournament, and then the men's uh, circumstances. And I guess what uh, what did you think when you saw those, and uh, what do you think the NCAA needs to do if they want to address the situation going forward? You know, I really in this podcast when we're, when when talking to you guys, I was waiting for an opportunity to talk about the women's side of the tournament. Um, I actually wanted to talk about Stanford's Final Four game and their championship game, uh, but when all that disparity came out, and you know, a lot of the players were, you know, you know, showing, and everybody was showing their support and the disappointment. It was just I looked at it; it was just very disappointing. Um, and even the comments, I don't know, if it was the president of the NCAA who. I think one of his responses was space, right? I think he said the space was was one of the issues. However, I think one of the one of the players came out on social media, and I know it was all over the place. And she posted a video of what the space looked like behind the curtain, and it was a whole bunch of space, right? Um, and even the food, the just the disparity between the men's side and the women's side. I think uh, it needs to be equal. That was just not right. It was very disappointing to see, um, but it was also good that. People were using platforms to show what it really is, and people can see what's really happening, and, and it's still happening, right? It's, it's, it's just tough. But to have six six sets of weights or whatever they had, and maybe there was more, but what I've kept seeing was a picture of dumbbells and a athletic training table, and that was it. And then you see a picture of the men's side, you know, with all all the equipment in the world. It was it was amazing. It was just like wow, like the girls couldn't even get half. Um, yeah. But my initial reaction was very disappointed and it hurt, right? I felt for, like I said, I coached on the, the girl side, on the women's side of basketball and to be part of that, you know, it's, it's tough. And it was just really hurting and just, you know, feeling for these athletes because um, definitely you know, the women's side and the basketball side, the game is the same and they had good games as well on the, you know, on the women's side, like Stan, like I was saying, Stanford, Haley Jones went to Mitty. She was the most outstanding player for the uh, tournament, so that was good to see. But there were some good games for them as well. Yeah, and I think another big name from the women's side was uh, Paige Weck, uh, sorry, Paige Buckers. Buckers. And yeah. she, oh, I don't know if you guys watched. That was another good game with Arizona and UConn. I, from <laughs> first quarter to the fourth quarter, Arizona, the three seed, uh, by the way, who, like, the first time they played Stanford in the league, lost by 20 points or more. You know, everybody thought they were just going to roll over and Paige was just going to have this great game, but it wasn't. that wasn't the case. Arizona had a great game plan, and Ari McDonald played the game pretty well. They controlled the game, and they beat you know, almighty UConn, which I, I was shocked just the way they beat them. I thought it was going to be closer, but they just – UConn did not have a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess just kind of looking at the bigger picture now, um, what do you think make, makes March Madness, like both the boys and girls side, what do you think makes it so special? Um, I think especially like in co comparison to like other college sports and tournaments, like um, it seems as though March Madness like draws, it has such a large appeal. People who've never watched the sport before, like fill out brackets, they're tuning in, checking the score, that sort of thing. So I guess, what do you think makes it so special? And like, what do you think makes it like have such a large appeal to like such a large audience? You know, I think, and I, I think, uh... A lot of the other sports have tournaments as well, uh, but I think the competition and how the games have been for both the men and the women's side have helped its, uh, I guess, its views on people and just attract many more people, right? Like, so maybe you weren't a basketball fan, but if you were an Oral Roberts fan, you would have been tuning in, right? They had, you know, like I said, there's so many chances for these smaller schools uh, to have a shot and do well. I mean, VCU right now, I mean, people know them more, but I had no idea who VCU was before Shaka Smart was there and they did well in the tournament, like all these schools. Like Abilene Christian, I didn't never heard of Abilene Christian. Um, but I think it gets the exposure for them. And when that happens and they do well, these smaller teams do well in the tournament, it just brings that uh, attraction of other people. But I think the competition, the games, the great games that happens in these men's and women's tournaments uh, attracts and brings in all these people to watch these games. 
Cool. I think that's all the questions I had. Muthu, do you have anything else you want to you wanna ask? Uh, no, I think I'm good. Uh, Coach, do you have anything you want to add? No, I mean, like I said, it was, it was a great NCAA men's tournament and same thing on the women's side. Uh, and I, you know, didn't even realize Stanford haven't, hasn't won since 1992. Mm -hmm. uh, they've always been a powerhouse team and a team that, you know, players always want to go to. Uh, but that was pretty awesome for Tara Vandeveer to finally win. And as you guys know, she's the all-time winningest coach. Uh, but I did at some point wanted to make sure we talked about the NCAA team. So, or for the women's side, but Stanford got lucky. There was a couple shots that was missed. <laughs> and if it would have went in, they would have lost. Um, but on the men's side, I was very, very excited to follow UCLA, even USC. So to watch all these West Coast teams, these Pac-12 teams really, really come out and show. Because lately, I don't know if you guys know in the basketball world, everyone almost still saying, oh, Pac-12 is getting a little weaker, getting a little weaker. But for them to come out and have a good showing on both tournaments uh, was pretty awesome. I do want to thank both of you for having me here today. Like I told you guys earlier, I was excited when you guys reached out. So. I hope this isn't the last time I get to speak to you guys here. Yep, definitely not. Thank you so much, Coach. You're welcome. You guys take care. You, you too. All right. Bye. All right, guys. That's all we have. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And as always, uh, check out the links in the description for uh, any Harker games going on right now since we finally got sports back. And uh, see you next time. Bye.